chest up, shoulders back. This is Revival Fitness. If you haven't already, guys, be sure to grab your program down below. Much more than just exercises on a sheet, you're gonna get a full guide of everything you need to know to make serious gains in the long haul. I began training about seven years ago, I believe, but whenever I started, Bro Science was still the king of the gym. Everybody listened to the biggest and most ripped guys, no matter how absurd they were talking. And to be fair, that hasn't entirely changed. Those type of guys are always going to get massive following simply because of how crazy they look, especially from the masses getting into fitness, because they don't know any better, they just see the people that look the craziest and assume they must know the most. But over the past number of years, it has been Revenge of the Nerds. And this isn't only in fitness, this has become life in general. As you guys have probably seen, nerds and dorks and those who were stuffed in lockers as kids, they have taken over pretty much every aspect of society. And everything sucks. Science is a liar sometimes. Oh boy. And when it comes to lifting, this has manifested in the science-based community very correlated to the optimal community. These guys really care about the numbers. Not the weight on the bar, but the amount of citations they have. And a good amount of the science-based crowd are genuinely big and jack dudes, which once again, people like to say that, oh, well, the bros only get their results because of steroids, and all the science-based guys are on steroids, so it's kind of a crapshoot. But in a lot of cases, the PubMed army, those that thump it like it's the Bible, they have relatively unimpressive results. And when it comes to the highest levels of bodybuilding, powerlifting, strongman, etc., the guys at the top are not science-based. The people at the highest levels are still doing all of the old school and bro methods, while the science-based crew are struggling for eighth place. The fact of the matter is, nine out of 10 so-called science-based guys don't even know how to interpret basic data, and they only read the title, abstract, and conclusion of studies if they even read beyond the title, and they don't even know the actual methods of how the studies were conducted. So let's take a quick look at this study for example. It's called Low Load Bench Press and Push-Up Induce Similar Muscle Hypertrophy and Strength Gain. This is something that a lot of guys online would look at and say, oh well, I should do the push-up over the bench press because this study says it's better. And here are the methods. 18 male participants, that's the entire size of this group, 18 people, age 20.2 plus or minus 0.73 years, between 19 to 22, height 169.8 plus or minus 4.4 centimeters, and 64.5 kilograms plus or minus 4.7, were randomly assigned to one or two experimental groups. Bench press at 40% 1RM, that is very low, or push-ups with position-adjusted kneeling to get the same load of the 40% 1RM bench press, performed twice per week for eight weeks. Muscle thickness at three sites, biceps, triceps, and pec major, bench press 1RM, maximum repetition at 40% 1RM, and power output with a medicine ball throw were measured before and after the training period. Now, if you didn't notice, there is no information given about how strong these guys already are going into the study. Are they novices? Are they closer to intermediate? How would these people doing the study even define those terms? Would they simply ask them, how long have you been training? We don't know the body fat of these guys. You know guaranteed that some are going to have more or less body fat than others. So all of these factors are going to influence the results. Significant increases in 1RM and muscle thickness, triceps and pec major, were observed in the bench press group and in the push-up group. They have all these little variations in the numbers. They're not extreme. Bicep thickness significantly increased only in the bench press group. Keep in mind this is over the span of eight weeks. So based on the amount of muscle thickness alone and increases in one rep max, you can pretty safely assume all of these guys are novices because anybody more experienced is not going to see this drastic of a difference. Even so, we don't know the exact method by which they're measuring this muscle thickness. And neither power output performance nor muscle endurance capacity changed in either group. The conclusion? Push-up exercise with similar low to 40% 1RM bench press is comparably effective for muscle hypertrophy and strength gain over an eight-week training period. What the hell is even that? And this tends to really bother the people that spent years and years and tens of thousands of dollars to get letters after their name. 
but the gym bros with no academic credentials, they are doing science. Good information is good information, no matter who is giving it. But plenty of suboptimal gym rats make better gains than the science-based crowd, the latter of whom spend much of their time in comment sections of the former trying to correct them. And that's probably the most annoying thing about the science-based craze, you have dudes who are still firmly novices themselves, trying to talk all of this big game as if they've been doing this for years. So with all that said, here are the four big reasons why the science-based obsession might be keeping you small, and weak, and confused, even though you're convinced that you know everything. And number one on the list, program hopping or modding. So what you typically see in the science-based crowd is that there's always a new method that is the new optimal thing, the new flavor of the month. So initially it was doing free weights first to start your workouts. Then there's a new study that shows that machines first actually optimize hypertrophy better. And then a new one comes out saying you have to pre-exhaust the muscles with isolation movements, then go into the heavier work. This month, two times a week frequency is best. Next month, it's three times a week. Then the month after that, it turns out that one time a week frequency has actually been best the whole time, and the bros were right. Whatever the popular science-based guys are talking about at any given moment, these guys are going to replicate it, even if it means changing their routine way too frequently. And this one might be my favorite. They will begin following a specialization program for a given muscle group, even though their entire body is still weak. I get a lot of questions about this too. Guys will send me pictures of their physique and they're like, hey man, I think my delts are lacking. And you look at their body and it's like, well, yeah, dude, your delts aren't amazing. Neither are your arms or your back or your legs. It's like, dude, you're just a young lifter. You need to improve everything holistically. I've talked before, guys, why you need to avoid the stuff you see in so much mainstream fitness. We have a four week, a six week, an eight week program and they're gonna have some crazy claim you can get six-pack abs in 30 days, you can build 10 pounds of muscle in four or six weeks, a bunch of nonsense. Now, some good programs are going to be implemented in waves or blocks, so maybe there's a six-week wave, then you repeat, maybe make some changes. That's not what I'm talking about. But the fact of the matter is, man, you need to stick to one consistent method or system of training for a while to really see the results from it. They will have a basic proven template. It is guaranteed to work if you follow what it says, and then they're going to try to max it out, like Pimp My Ride. Some of you might be too young to remember this show, but it was basically a car customization show, and they would take these old clunker ghetto cruiser cars, and they would totally turn them into something that wasn't even suitable to be driven on the road. They'd be putting fish tanks in the trunk, Xboxes on the center console, mini bars in the back seat, and now the car looks cool from the outside, but it's not even really operable, and you can't even see out of the mirrors. That's novices trying to optimize their program. And that leads us on to the second reason, junk volume. And this really ties into the first point, because you see all of these new exercises that these guys promote all the time. There's always something new to do that is going to hit the muscle much better than anything you've ever done. And part of this, guys, is simply marketing. I mean, in the fitness industry, you have to come up with new stuff to keep holding people's attention, right? This is why Athlean X has a million videos about different types of curls that you can do. It's why Joel Seedman comes up with a million at this point exercises to do. Give Joel Seedman credit. That guy never runs out of ideas. It's actually pretty impressive for what it's worth. But that's why these guys do this. You have to hold people's attention somehow. And especially if you're not a high-level competitor, you're not like a major athlete or anything, and this happens like clockwork. Some YouTuber or influencer will mention a new exercise, and then I'll get a bunch of questions over the next few days about it, saying, where can I throw this into my routine? And the exercise is usually nothing major. We mentioned this in the previous video about volume, guys, right? The cable press around fly thing everyone does now for their chest. I think Jeff Nippard talked about that. The iliac fiber pull down for the back, that's been very popular for a while now. I see skinny dudes in my gym every single time I'm there doing that exercise. They kneel down, let alone they drag a bench over, and they just sit there and they pull it like this. And by the way, guys, these are not necessarily bad exercises. Like, they're fine to do, but they're not magical. They're not hitting these fibers that nothing else can hit. They're not going to enhance your muscle growth by some amazing degree. The old school physiques, it's very funny, the physiques that are still idolized the most, Frank Zane, Arnold, 
all the Golden Era guys, they did none of this stuff. Even Chris Bumstead, when asked to name his top 10 muscle building exercises, you can check out my full reaction to that in the top corner, he essentially went over starting strength at the beginning. He was like, squat, deadlift, bench press. But when you see all of these new exercises, especially as a young guy, your first reaction is, oh, well, I have to do this now because this guy said it helped blow up his biceps. And of course, in his bio, it says natural with the Trident emoji or the DNA emoji or the 100 emoji. So he has to be natural, right? It blew up his biceps, so I have to do it too. So every time you see one of these new things, you have to add it into your routine. Then you blink your eyes. You have an avalanche of exercises every day. You're going to hurt your own recovery, spend a bunch more time in the gym than you need to. So I think you're much better suited as opposed to hopping around six to eight different chest exercises every single week, let alone more. Really hammer down maybe four to five chest exercises, do those for a prolonged period. Once you start to plateau, you can maybe rotate one or two out. That is going to serve you much better in the long run. And you need to focus on the heavier stuff too, to really build your strength base and your muscular base. And that leads us into the third point here, the overcomplication of training. And something that I see very, very prominently in the science-based crowd is this alleged giant differentiation between, I can't even say it without getting upset, Training for size and training for strength, or I I'm sorry, training for hypertrophy, not strength. So many of these guys talk as if these are two entirely different disciplines, like powerlifters only train one way, bodybuilders train another, as if there's like no overlap between the two. I don't know if you guys realize this, but most of the best powerlifters have this mentality now, where they do the power lifts in most of their workouts, if not all their workouts, then they do accessory work, which means hypertrophy work. So they do their big core lifts, then they build muscle, and also as if their main exercises are not building muscle anyway. Do you guys really think a hard set of five on deadlifts, especially for multiple sets, even if you're doing back off sets, do you think that's not going to grow muscle? I'm not saying it's the perfect way, but do you really believe that's not going to grow muscle? Do you think a few hard sets of squats are not going to build muscle just because it's the dreaded power lifts? And on that same note too, a lot of bodybuilders, even very high ranking ones, we just talked about Chris Bumstead, they do the power lifts. They squat, they bench press, they deadlift, or they do very close variations of those. You guys have got to get out of this godforsaken idea that these are such different things. People talk about strength as if it's only one rep maxes in powerlifting. I train for hypertrophy, not strength. Okay, here's a question. How do you keep getting more hypertrophy? And they'll say, well, you have to progressively overload. Okay, you ready? What is progressively overloading? It is a fancy nerd term for getting stronger. The PubMed Army says, we are progressively overloading the resistance with each passing workout. The bros say, I'm adding weight to the bar. It's the same shit. If you're training for peak strength, you're gonna have to max out relatively often. You don't have to do that for general hypertrophy, and you don't have to focus on just the bench squat and deadlift if you're not in powerlifting. Besides those two components, size and strength are very, very closely related. They're symbiotic. It's very funny because these science-based guys talk like they're always on the cutting edge of all this new stuff, and they're going to advocate things like, oh, size and strength are so different. This is outdated thinking, and those separate phases... They're outdated technology. Louis Simmons, rest in peace, figured this out at Westside Barbell, what, 30 or 40 years ago? To my knowledge, he did not have any advanced qualifications. He was a straight-up gym bro. He ran the most successful powerlifting gym on the planet. And outside of just the size and strength dichotomy these guys like to really draw and hype up, there's a lot of other stuff too. I'm sure you've heard big fancy terms like MEV, minimum effective volume, MRV, maximum recoverable volume. We're going to oscillate from 4 RIR at the beginning of our mesocycle to 0 RIR at the end. If you ask me, man, this is overly complicated, especially for the vast majority of people's goals. And really, even if you're a serious lifter, I'm not convinced this style of training brings anything to the table. And don't get it twisted here. I'm not saying that these concepts are bad or useless. I like to go with RIR over RPE because I think it's a little bit easier for general trainees to gauge like how many reps they could do left versus just esoterically how hard a set was. Even so, guys, some of these science-based programs and methodologies and all this other stuff, they're just really, really intricate. When returning to this point too, a lot of these people need to just master the basics and do the stuff for a while. 
that's going to get you just as far, I would argue probably even further, than getting into all of the scientific gobbledygook just because it sounds so much cooler. Big words don't always mean bigger biceps. And on the topic of the basics, that leads us into the final point here. People who are obsessed with science-based training think they are above the basics. So how many times have you seen this on YouTube or Instagram, TikTok, wherever? Some big jack guy will be doing deadlifts or he'll be doing squats. Some very basic exercise. Ooh, this is a good one. Bent over barbell rows. Then in the comment section, what do you see? You know, I, this isn't optimal for hypertrophy, bro. You could actually do a chest supported row. Well, it's actually a waste of time, you see, because you're involving too much of the lower back. <laughs> now this can get into some muddy water because as I mentioned at the beginning, it's very common for the masses to think, oh, well, this guy's bigger than you. He must be smarter. You can watch the videos I've made about guys like Ryan Humiston. These normies can't conceptually understand that I'm actually making valid critiques. They think it's just hating if you talk about a guy that's bigger than you. But a trend I see so much among the science-based crowd is that they will just take every opportunity they can to turn people away from the basic exercises. Well, the bench press is not a good chest exercise. And you're like, dude, how could it not be? You're lowering a bar down to your chest in a horizontal position and then pressing it up. The pecs are a primary mover in that movement. How could your pecs not be working? Oh, the barbell row is not good for the back. Oh, the squats are actually not a very good quad exercise. Does this mean that they're the absolute apex for muscle building? Not necessarily. But if you think that the core basic exercises that have gotten people big and strong for decades and decades are not going to do the same for you, you have been disillusioned and you're lying to yourself. You need to really master the basics in my opinion, I know this is not popular to say to the science-based crowd because they think you should just optimize everything from day one. Maybe I'm old-fashioned, but if you don't have a grasp on the basics, you can't optimize anything. But there's always a new science-based method or exercise coming to popularity. They tend to come and go. You know what works all the time? The basics. This is foolproof. It's time-tested. It works for men, women, every ethnicity, old, young, Short, tall, fat, skinny, it does not matter. If you think that is a remotely controversial statement, I feel very bad for you. But this has been it for me, guys. Thank you very much for watching. Shout out, as always, to the Patreon supporters and the channel members to get in direct contact with me down there, as well as joining our Discord, grab your program, and save money on some great products and services. And I will catch you guys next time. <laughs>